Sustainable energy sources are growing in popularity, but we are here to sort the wheat from the chaff to check out which technologies are going to make the most impact and which are likely to be less useful. I'm Afia Adom. And I'm Ashley House, and this is Sustainable Energy. Hello and welcome to the programme. Today we're taking a look at one of the most basic of energy sources and one which energised the move from caveman to modern man, biomass and bioenergy. Did you know that biomass derived energy has been used since humans first discovered how to harness fire? But the biomass industry itself wasn't established until the 1970s oil crisis when people started to look for new sources of energy. Now these days bioenergy is about far more than just burning wood. In fact scientists have developed highly complex methods that can transform grass into biogas and vegetable oils into biodiesel. And that new technology really is propelling organic material into a viable alternative energy source. Coming up we visit the land of the Komodo dragons in Indonesia to see how the nation's biggest palm oil producer is improving sustainability. Waste Not Want Not, a vegetable farm in Kenya that's utilising crop byproducts to produce electricity and fertiliser. Weaning ourselves off coal, we look at the technology allowing power stations to transition to biomass. And finally, we talk to the UK's leading green energy company about plans to produce energy from the stuff under our feet, grass. In the meantime, I travelled to the sunny Italian capital to meet our biomass expert, who's a natural resources officer at the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organisation. According to the International Energy Agency, bioenergy provides 10% of world total primary energy supply, making it the single largest renewable energy source. In 2014, biofuels provided 4% of world road transport fuel and are expected to rise slowly, reaching almost 4.3% in 2020. In 2012, 370 terawatt hours of bioenergy electricity were produced equivalent to 1.5% of world electricity generation. Now, when you think about the palm oil industry, you may recall headlines from the late noughties about how it's environmentally damaging. But the industry is fighting back, responding to the criticism and changing with the time. When you're the world's second biggest palm oil plantation company and you're feeling the pressure to be more sustainable, what do you do? You build a research facility. Or at least that's what Golden Agri Resources has done. Uh, the objective of the company is to produce uh, oil, sustainable oil, uh, for the world demand, whatever the consumer wants to use this oil for, whether it's for food, whether it's for energy, or whether it's for cosmetic or any other purpose. But the important thing for us is to produce the oil in a sustainable way, meaning that no uh, deforestation, no risk on the environment, and using the best practices. Palm oil is a vegetable oil derived from the fruit of, unsurprisingly, oil palms. Most commonly, the product is used as a raw material in food production, cosmetics and detergents. But in recent years, it's grown in popularity as a source for first-generation biofuels, such as biodiesel. That is the base brought down to biogas by using a bioreactor which is a completely biological process by using mesopelic uh, bacteria to decompose the pomi and break down uh, the waste water to generate methane gas. Methane gas being uh, captured, uh, purified and used at our gas engine to generate power. Biofuels have become an attractive alternative to fossil fuels because they release fewer greenhouse gas emissions. Not only that, when oil palm is planted, it can continue growing for up to 30 years, meaning it has a high carbon capture value. What is interesting with uh, palm oil as a plant, it is accumulate carbon in the form of the trunk and in the, in the biomass in the, in the, in the canopy. Uh, every year, the palm oil is able to capture about 11 tonnes of carbon 
meaning about 40, 44 tons of carbon dioxide per hectare per year. And this can accumulate in the, in, in the biomass of the, of the tree and be recycled every year. When we cut the fronds, we leave them decomposed in the soil, enrich the soil with organic matter, means with organic carbon. And when we do the replanting after 25 years or 30 years, also all this biomass, which represents about 100 tons of biomass, let's say about 40 tons of carbon, we also recycle this in our, in our soils. Still, some are critical, saying that with the global population predicted to expand to more than 9 billion by 2050, growing biomass for biofuels is increasingly unrealistic. We need food and we need fuel. There's no getting around that. The solution is in developing them more sustainably. Andrea Rossi is an expert in sustainable bioenergy and food security. He is the Natural Resources Officer at the Food and Agricultural Organization of the United Nations. Andrea, thank you so much for having us here on the gorgeous rooftop of the FAO building. Thank you for coming. We can see a lot of green and that's perfect because today we're talking about biomass. So Andrea, firstly, tell me a little bit about yourself, your work on bioenergy and what exactly you do here at the FAO. Sure, here at FAO I focus on sustainable bioenergy production and use. And in particular, I support developing countries in the design and implementation of sustainable bioenergy policies and strategies that foster both energy security and food security. So when we talk about bioenergy, we traditionally think of developing countries where they would use, say, wood to burn to cook food. Now, just how important is that for countries like that who aren't connected to the grid? Extremely important. Today, 2.7 billion people are still relying on traditional biomass, such as fuel wood and charcoal, for cooking. And uh, the share of people relying on these fuels is as high as 80% in Sub-Saharan Africa and 50% in developing Asia. And oftentimes, these fuels, such as fuel wood and charcoal, are used in inefficient stoves and burned in open fires with no chimney or hood. And according to the World Health Organization, more than 4 million people a year die prematurely as a result of exposure to indoor air pollution linked to the use of traditional biomass. Now, Andre, we've just heard about the importance of sustainability when it comes to using palm oil as a method of bioenergy. In your opinion, can you tell me why this is so important? There have been uh, concerns related to uh, palm oil uh, mm -hmm. production, uh, but there are several ways to which uh, palm oil production can be made more efficient and more sustainable. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, there is a lot of uh, room to significantly increase the productivity of oil palm uh, cultivation, especially at smallholder level. For instance, through the introduction of in higher yielding varieties and improved management practices. Mm -hmm. And if palm oil production is made more efficient and productive, then more palm oil can be produced using the same land mm -hmm. and there's no need for further land uh, expansion. Andrea, thank you so much for that. Stay with us. Now, think you know everything there is to know about biomass? Here are some common misconceptions. You thought you knew? Think again. Myth. Biomass increases greenhouse gases. Fact, burning biomass does release carbon dioxide, but the process doesn't have to be a net emitter. You see, plants, via photosynthesis, absorb carbon dioxide. And throughout their lives, they can capture the same amount that would be produced if they were burnt. In other words, with proper management, burning biomass can be carbon neutral. When it comes to environmental issues, you don't often hear about the inspiring nature of bovines, but actually a cow's digestive system is a highly efficient processing plant, converting biomass, mainly grass, into energy. So why not be inspired by physiology and turn it into technology? It's taken five years and many sleepless nights, but finally, Oxford-based eco-entrepreneur Mike Mason has achieved his vision, producing biogas from plant waste. Anaerobic digestion is a well-established technology. Gorge Farm has hundreds of tonnes a week of waste, and it seemed a shame not to be using it. So I was sitting with some friends, really, over a beer, and they weren't aware of the technology, and I wasn't aware of the scale of their waste, and we put two and two together, and it became blindingly obvious that it was a good idea. 
Mike's farm is close to Lake Naivasha, around 90 kilometers northwest of the Kenyan capital, Nairobi. On 700 hectares of land, they grow flowers and 20 varieties of vegetables, including baby corn, broccoli, and cauliflower, mainly for export to Europe. As well as feeding people, the crops are now providing the food that fills the belly of this beast, the anaerobic digestion plant. What essentially you are looking at is a big mechanical cow. You feed it biomass on one end, it gives you manure and liquid fertilizer on the other end, and in the process, gives you biogas. Once you've got the biogas, now you've got the fuel that is required to run the next section of the plant, which is the electricity. Anaerobic digestion is a natural process in which bacteria convert organic materials into biofertilizer and biomethane. It takes around 16 days for the conversion, with biomass working its way through these four different tanks. Once we've got the biogas, we need to turn the biogas to electricity. And they do, the way we do this is using an engine generator, a gas engine generator. Essentially, this is just like an engine in a car, in a normal vehicle. The only difference is that instead of using petrol or diesel, use biogas to run it. At maximum capacity, the biogas plant will require around 120,000 kilograms of biomass residue from the farm every day. This will generate up to 2.2 megawatt hours of electricity. Most of the electricity going goes to moving water to where it's required in the farm, and that is pumping. As for heat, what we've got is greenhouses, and greenhouses need some optimum temperature at which you get optimum production from plants. Sometimes to achieve this, the farm will use diesel boilers to heat the greenhouses. We intend to displace these diesel boilers and basically pipe the heated water to the greenhouses. Crucially, any excess electricity that isn't required by the farm is fed into the national grid. These sorts of facilities can be replicated, supporting the environment and local economies along the way. Recent research shows that we could speed up the process of digestion by up to perhaps 30 times. Do that and we change the whole relationship between agricultural waste and energy and every farm, every farmer becomes an energy supplier as well as a food grower. What are the opportunities for developing countries to develop the use of anaerobic digestion even further so more people can be connected to sustainable energy resources? And of course, what are the limitations with that? Uh, anaerobic digestion is a mature technology with a strong potential and significant amounts of biogas can be produced through the anaerobic digestion of agro-industrial and livestock residues. Mm -hmm. um, this biogas can then be used to generate heat and electricity and part of the heat can be used for the industrial process and the surplus heat can be supplied to local communities through uh, district heating systems. This type of technology has a lot of potential but of course there are also challenges and, and barriers that need to be overcome. And this is, again, where the importance of a long-term, stable, enabling environment comes into the picture. Uh, some of these limitations include artificially low energy prices uh, due to fossil fuel subsidies, um, the uh, high upfront investment uh, required for the installation of the technology and its purchase, of course, um, and combined with high cost of capital and in some cases um, problems accessing credit uh, mm -hmm. that can be faced by investors in developing uh, countries. Are there opportunities for developing countries to do some sort of technological leapfrogging, skip the use of fossil fuels and move straight to renewables? This is an issue that has been extensively debated in the literature over the past 20 years. And in my view, when it comes to modern bioenergy, uh, a concrete example of such leapfrogging uh, is represented by the hundreds of thousands of households that around the world, and especially in Southeast Asia, have uh, gone from using uh, traditional biomass, uh, such as fuel wood and charcoal mm -hmm. for cooking, mm -hmm. to using biogas obtained through anaerobic digestion mm -hmm. of agriculture and especially livestock residues uh, for heating and cooking and for lighting. So in this case, these households have been 
uh, able to move away and um, uh, transition from uh, reliance on traditional biomass to modern bioenergy technologies and uh, services without the use of fossil fuels. Coming up after the break, we take a look at a power plant that's transitioned from the dirtiest of fossil fuels to something that's carbon neutral. And we talk to the founder of Britain's greenest energy company about his plans to use the most basic of resources, grass. Still watching? Perfect. Click here to watch another great video from CNBC International. Oh, and don't forget to subscribe. Thanks for watching.